I'm Tony Wood with Tyner Commercial Real Estate, and today I'm here with Rob Winkler, the CEO of Fifth Planet Games, one of the top game makers in the internet and mobile <laughs> networks. Is that safe to say? When, uh, yeah, it's pretty close. How would you say what, uh, what Fifth Planet Games is in terms of the game making world and how it places or it ranks in that? Sure. Um, we, we've definitely carved out our own little niche. We focus on mobile and social games that are traditionally more uh, kind of hardcore. So um, we don't make real casual style games for the masses. We make role playing games for people like me, people mm -hmm. like our employees that really are um, looking for games with depth and with a lot of substance and a lot of fun, a lot of immersion in them. And where are your game players, the people who participate with your games? Where do they come from? So they're all over the world. We tend to focus on English speaking because our games are not translated and they are pretty word heavy. We have, you know, one of our games alone, we have over a million words. So it's, you know, multiple novels worth of, of content there. Um, so we tend to focus on US, Europe, um, Australia, things like that. But there, we have people from everywhere to play the game. One of the reasons why I really wanted to do this interview with you is because the company is such a collaborative company and there's fun seems to be a main element in, in not only just what you produce, but how you work together every day. And in working with you to find your new corporate headquarters, which we'll talk about later, uh, there was clearly a culture involved. And since one of the things we're doing with our videos here is looking at how intentional culture works in different uh, business settings and how mm -hmm. companies intentionally uh, create their culture and, and how that results, how would you, what would you say or how would you describe your culture? And how would you uh, say you incorporated in the work that you do and the people that you do and how it ultimately uh, ends up at the other end of the line with your customers? Sure. Um, I think collaborative is a very good word for it. Um, we've always been very team focused, very team oriented in, in um, everything that we do. We, we have a, one of our philosophies is a very strong sense of um, empowerment in, by our team. We want to make sure that the decisions are made by the experts, not necessarily by, you know, people that might be out of touch, but have some sort of a higher title and the hierarchy. It doesn't really make a lot of sense for what we do. Hmm. Um, so we've worked really hard on creating teams that understand their role in this team, but also understand the product really well. Um, so it, it helps people feel confident in their decisions, because a lot of times they know the right answer, but they won't speak up because they might not have the experience or the, the title to you know, make them feel like they have a say in what's going on. So we've tried to really strip that away um, since the beginning, and that's been one of the things that's been, you know, a focus of us as we've started to, to scale. Um, so are the teams, uh, each game has its own team or yep. each element of a game has its team? So they're kind of both. So there are some shared services like the, the UI team. They work on all the different games. And because there's not always a constant need UI the is user interface. Okay. So, um, or the art team, they, there's different needs between the different games at different times. Mm -hmm. But for each game has, a, has its own team. So there is a design lead that you know, basically comes up with the items that are going to be in the game. There is the, the writer that's going to kind of talk about the direction and vision um, of the story. There is the producer that's in charge of making sure that the build goes out, that the actual items are you know, created in the database and they're put into the game each week. And those are people that don't go to different games. They just work on that one game all the mm -hmm. time. There's also a community manager, the person that's in charge of just talking to our players every single day. Mm -hmm. And they are all just completely focused 100% on that game. Hmm. So how do you know uh, who fits where, not just from a talent perspective, but maybe personality? Do you have to look at that? Are you concerned with that? Absolutely. So when we're going through the hiring process, we're looking, the, the, the same we use, we're looking for athletes. We're not looking for quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for people that, nest, that have a good skill set. It could be a very broad skill set, have the right attitude, that are strong in multiple areas because they might have experience in one field, but we found that might not be where they're best suited in our company. Mm -hmm. So we have quite a few examples of people that came in at one position and work at a different position and, and do exceedingly well, actually. Mm -hmm. I use the example a lot of our lead designer for Dawn. That's our number one game by a significant margin. Mm -hmm. He has completely taken over you know, the, the design and vision and really the monetization of our most important product. Mm -hmm. He started as a community manager for a different game. Mm -hmm. So he, we knew he was somebody that was, uh, you would say we use, he was on the bus. He was engaged, he was, yeah. you know, lived and breathed 5PG, mm -hmm. lived and breathed games, and 
really wanted to find the right place for him. And it wasn't where he started. He kind of failed at that first position, actually. And so mm. instead of getting rid of him, we were trying to find the right spot for him to thrive. Mm. And, you know, we took a risk putting him on this big game, and that was, you know, well over a year ago now, and he's done just amazingly well. That's interesting. We were talking earlier about the Walgreens yeah. kind of culture where if, if someone doesn't fit, they don't just fire him, but they, they really are devoted or committed to the culture being someone doing something they like doing, yep. that they're comfortable doing and that they can excel at, which makes them happier, obviously produce better results, and the customer, the end customer, is also uh, feeling better about what they're receiving. Yeah, and that, that, that I think shines all the way through. The people that are engaging with our players, our community managers, even our developers to some extent, they are very happy with what they do. They do that does trickle down to the user. Um, there's the, the kind of the light ways that it does it on the forums, but there's also the more direct way when we have player councils. So that's something that is somewhat unique to our company. We fly our players out for a weekend, huh. and it's like a really intense focus. How do they usually. win that prize? So it, it's, it's, it is kind of a How golden many? ticket. Okay. It's usually five or six per game. Okay. And we do it a little under once a year. Uh -huh. um, but they, they, we, we make them fill out a big kind of forum and questionnaire, and it's, it's not only the, what the content, but the way that they answer the questions. Um, so we're looking for a, a wide variety of different types of players, but the, when they come in, they always leave just completely with their mind blown because not only like the stuff that we go over is really cool, but they get to see how passionate the team is about this game and how important it is to us and how personal it is. Mm -hmm. And so that always, it's a nice kind of side effect. It wasn't the intent originally, but it's a nice side effect that we have these kind of evangelists now that can go back to the community. They're one of them, but they can say, these people understand what they're doing. They care about it as much as we do. And it kind of... They, they cut us a little break because mm -hmm. of that, which is which is nice for the, especially for the community team. That's that's really neat. I, I uh, one of the things I love about the work I do, which I've done for a very long time, is uh, because I don't specialize in one particular niche, be it office or industrial or retail. But I, I really kind of work project to project, depending on what it is, and uh, we kind of apply our our formula to whatever that might be. Uh, one of the things that is so wonderful is getting to know about these different types of industries. And mm -hmm. I mean, I've done everything from a uh, uh, an aluminum foundry, right, to a Fifth Planet Games, mm -hmm. which is just so different. Yeah. But the thing that is consistent is you're usually working with the leadership of the company and you're really getting an opportunity to get some insight into, into the company, the product, their customer base, and, and play a role there in their, their goals of, in, in, your turn, in your situation, growth. And let's talk about that a little bit. Sure. Because uh, when did this start? Whose idea was it? How did you go from that that good idea or their not so good idea that turned into a good idea and then what you've turned into today and where you're headed in the future? So it actually did start out as a not so good dragons? idea. And why dragons? Oh yeah, no, that's By that. the way, my son and I kid about your games like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's we've got a new game and uh -huh. he says, don't tell me, it's Dragon King. I'm like, no, it's not Dragon King, <laughs> it's Dawn of the Dragons. Oh. And we have the new, you know, and we're like Dragon Sun and Dragon Life and Dragon Kids. And it's so fun because it's just a, such a, who doesn't like dragons yeah, yeah. and who isn't intrigued with dragons? So you got to tell me about, is there some sort of double entendre with the dragons, right? And is it symbolic for some sort of human battle that we're in? <laughs> That's a whole other story. So go yeah. back to my first question. So uh, it, the company was actually started by uh, me and a small group of friends, just a few of us that um, we... Some of us met a while ago, some of us met recently, but we all kind of connected through playing online games together. So we used to play a lot of EverQuest, and then after that, many years of World of Warcraft. So we um, we led like a hardcore raiding guild. Like it was something we were just really, really into, and we were really good at. And um, we used to talk a lot about the game. We used to play the game a lot, but we used to talk a lot about the game, and then just kind of would get the idea in our head that we could make a better game, which was not necessarily true, but it, it motivated us to like see what we could actually do. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the first idea was the bad idea, which was we were going to make a browser-based MMO. So um, games like World of Warcraft are considered MMOs, massively mm -hmm. multiplayer online games. Mm -hmm. Those are extremely difficult to do. So we started to do that first, which was never going to happen. Mm -hmm. But it, it gave us the opportunity to kind of get our foot in the door, start learning about the industry, start going to every conference we could, start making connections. And then after about nine months, we figured out how bad of an idea it was. And then that's when we decided to pivot. And we decided that Facebook was an opportunity for us. This was uh, late 2009, early 2010, mm -hmm. for us to actually make a game that people could play. Um, and we took a lot of what we learned there and applied it to our first game, which became Dawn of the Dragons. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the theme, 
it was something that we were passionate about because it's something that we always liked. That those, those are common themes in games like EverQuest and World of Warcraft and these other games. This fantasy was something that was exciting and engaging to us, and dragons are just kind of the pinnacle of that. You know, that's mm -hmm. what makes some of these things epic and awesome. Mm -hmm. And so the, with the, the theme of Dawn of the Dragons, which is like the beginning of the, you know, the Dragon Wars and all the, you know, just so much awesome stuff to come. Mm -hmm. And so we felt that was a good kind of setting to start our game. And mm -hmm. We kind of built from there. Good. Did you start on Facebook, yeah. basically? That's yeah. where you, you really began this, you launched this, this kind of platform. Yep. And then from there, uh, what happened that, that kind of there's an exponential growth was yep. there at some point? How long did that take to get there and what do you attribute that to? It took a little while. Besides the brilliance of the idea, because <laughs> some of it is just simply, it was attractive. Yep, it, it was the kind of, we, we made a decision early on after the launch of the game, once we found out that it could be successful, that we really want to double down, that we want to focus on growth. We didn't want to just try and be a one hit wonder. So we really tried to reinvest as much as we could into the company, started hiring you know, smarter people than us, just mm -hmm. tried to really always make sure that we had good, smart people around. Um, and then the, the thing financially that really helped us is that we started to diversify our platforms. So we were only on Facebook for a while. Mm -hmm. Facebook came out with Facebook credits in 2000, uh, 2011, and it was basically like a tax on what we were doing. And so mm -hmm. we kind of figured out that if we want to survive, we need to make sure that we're not 100% relying on Facebook. So we found other platforms like Congregate, eventually mobile, you know, on Apple and on Android uh, phones that didn't even, didn't cannibalize our existing market, but were, you know, in addition to that. So it really helped us grow because we'd already done all of the hard stuff, which was make a fun game that monetized. Right. Mm -hmm. We just needed to put it in front of more users. This allowed us to do that in um, a very, very significant way. Today, we're really aware of the fact that some people are quoting as much as 70 to 80 percent of the consumer activity is going mobile now, and companies are really focusing on that. So, Rob, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about the mobile app, where that came into play, and, and what impact it had. Yeah. Um, so, about a year ago, we decided that we really wanted to up our mobile presence, um, and we felt that it was a another opportunity, like you said, that for, for growth for our company that we had employed in the, in the past, it was purely going to different web platforms and this was a, a whole different device. So it was a bit of a daunting task for us at first, but we um, launched our first game, um, which was also Dawn of the Dragons on mobile, um, right about a year ago. Um, we felt that that was us kind of putting our best foot forward. It was a game that had been really successful on web and, and it's done phenomenally well for us on mobile so far. So since then we've launched um, we, we ported another game, Legacy of a Thousand Suns, over to mobile, and, and the next title that we're working on is a, is a brand new title, um, and it's going to be released on um, mobile first. So we'll eventually launch it on web, but we're going to launch it on mobile first, which is the opposite of everything we've done before, just because it's such a great opportunity, and this specific game style and type um, lends itself better to mobile. It's, it's more popular than, than it is necessarily on web. So. Uh... The real purpose of this series is to empower companies in the area of intentional culture and how it works and, and managing within it and the end result of it. And we were talking a little bit about when you go to institute um, a new culture or intentional culture into a workplace setting, what will immediately or very shortly appear is an existing culture that mm -hmm. wasn't intentional. And so there's some barriers to the experience of the opportunity of the new culture because, as you said, it may be as simple as people are resistant to change or uh, afraid of change or it is difficult for them to embrace the new culture because they're so comfortable with, with the existing one. Now, you, I assume, for the most part, have had a, a particular concept or culture from day one, but as you grew, that must have been challenging to maintain. It's like, this is what we're committed to. So tell me yeah. a little bit about that experience. It's absolutely been a challenge for a couple different reasons. One, at the beginning, you know, I was involved in every single hire, even if it wasn't in my department. It was something, it was somebody that I talked to, got to know before we hired them. And so I was able to be there kind of from the beginning. Um, that doesn't obviously scale. I still talk to everybody before we hired them, but it's not to the level that I used to. And then once they start, you know, they kind of go off and do their own thing if they're in a different department than, mm -hmm. than, than my design department. So that's been a little more difficult. So for that, we've had to find, make sure that the people that are in those departments, that they are, you know, those flag bearers themselves, they're the mm -hmm. ones that are pushing culture. They're the ones that understand what we do. So that's been more of a, I guess, communication issue um, and communicating that vision down to everyone so they can communicate it back to me or come back to new people that start. Mm -hmm. um, we've done a 
better job of that. It's hard sometimes, especially when it's real explosive growth. We, there was a while that we were hiring you know, more than a person a week. And so you know, over a couple of months, you just get this big influx of new people that it's kind of hard to always keep. You Is know, there an content. indoctrination or how do they be? I mean, besides just, you know, if you live here long enough, you'll feel it. But do you have? There's some a little bit of that. We, we have, you know, there's definitely discussions that during the interview process and also when they start. Um, we need to formalize that bit, a bit more. You know, one of the things we talked about that we haven't pulled the trigger on yet is getting more of like an employee handbook. We have one, but it's a lot of just the, the legal stuff that we have to do. Mm -hmm. One where it's a little more fun that talks about, you know, what it's like, life is like mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. So that's something that is. Uh, Maybe a game. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> we can just make it into a game. That would be so much better. It's a brilliant idea. Um, the second part of the, 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 the growth issues that we've had um, are people bringing in their own culture mm. and their own outside um, perceptions. I mean, we have people that bring in, we'll call them bad habits mm -hmm. from other companies or other parts of the industry. And it's been hard to kind of break them of that. And so they're not always intentionally bad. They're, they're some people that have, they may be recognized as fine wherever they can, maybe correct. even they necessary. Yeah. One of the biggest things is work-life balance. So a lot of times in the industry, um, companies will just run you into the ground. It, crunch time is something that's expected. And, and technology is really known for that. Yeah. And so that we don't believe in that. We think that that's just going to burn people out. It's going to make them unhappy. It's going to make them unproductive. Mm -hmm. So we have sometimes people that feel that they have to kind of prove themselves by coming in at 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. yeah. and staying until 7 p.m. every day mm -hmm. and working on the weekends. And we have to kind of break them of those habits. So the, well, first of all, you really should be able to do it in your normal work day. If you can't, then let's look at why that's happening and we can make adjustments. Um, but it's also, you know, you need to be happy outside of what we do here. It's great that you like hanging out with people and working, but we got to find the right balance to make sure that you're happy, that your family that's supporting you is happy, you know, all the different things around you. Mm -hmm. So that's been one of, the, one of the more prevalent, one of the harder things to kind of break people of, that it's, it's okay to go home. You should go. Interesting. To relax. So I have been to uh, when we started this. You you had just moved into the to like a six thousand square foot space, yep. and now you're in uh, a twenty thousand, and you, who knows when you may be forty thousand. Yeah. Right. So um, when you uh, well in our search for the space, it was quite challenging because one uh, as we discovered early on. It wasn't so much the culture and the collaborative. That, that's common in many different types of businesses. But you had some very specific goals with regards to tenant improvements that, yes. that not only were unusual, but that most landlords would be sort of coming from a place of, you want that, you can pay for it. Yep. Right? Uh, in this space here, pretty much every interior wall is either glass or whiteboard paint. Yep. And you can write on just about every service that there is throughout the space, yep. which you actually do utilize. And we'll have some more tape of that later about that. Um, so we, as we went through that process, and, and it was frustrating because a couple of times we thought we had landed at the right place, but when it came to TIs, we really ran into resistance yeah. for this, this type of uh, TI. So obviously you had a, a real commitment to a particular type of physical space that would support the culture. So was that, how intentional was that? It was extremely intentional. I mean, um, you know, me and the team that were involved with that all had a vision and it was, it was a shared vision and it was a collaborative vision. And it was something that we, you know, the space that we moved in before was already kind of set up. We were able to make some minor changes to kind of fit for us. But with this, this was an opportunity to set things the way we wanted them to really take our company, we felt, to the next level. Because a lot of it is what you have around you and, and not only the people that obviously we can influence that, but this was the first time that we could influence the way that, you know, the office was laid out, the things that people could do, the things that they could see, the way that they could experience that. Mm -hmm. So we really felt that was just, just so critical to what we were doing. And so it did make it frustrating and take a lot longer. And we had to jump through a lot of hoops and we had to find just the right partner. Well, um, speaking of culture, here you were with this particular type of open collaborative culture, and then you were kind of, to some extent, running into the culture of commercial real estate yeah. in this particular market, which was one of, you, you, you came to find out that the deal was as good of or as flexible as the ownership or landlord was. Yep. And it was not just only finding the right space or even a landlord willing to do what you wanted, but finding essentially someone who bought into and accepted the culture you had, yep. which I think you did when you Absolutely. finally landed. We, we really lucked out. I mean, they, we have great partners yeah. um, here that that have let us create, you know, exactly what we want. And um, like you said, I think that was the biggest thing is they kind of bought it. And they saw the vision too, mm -hmm. and um, it's worked really, really well for yeah. us so far. It's good. Yeah, I'm happy. So speaking about the search and, and finally landing here as your new home. Uh, 
how is it working? One of the things, ever since I started working with you, I, I saw the arsenal of Nerf guns mm -hmm. and other assorted gaming opportunities, but I've never seen it in action. So you have to tell me, <laughs> when does that occur? I've never seen anything like, and I was like, do they really all arm up and like play these games? So tell me about that. So we've had a couple uh, nerf raids, as we'll call them, where it's you know a tactical kind of kill the lights. You know, we'll rush a group or something. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, it's very spontaneous. It's just kind of, especially with the games, it's when people just kind of need a break from what they're doing. We give them that opportunity to, whenever they need to step away, go ahead and you know play on the Xbox for a few hours, go play some ping pong, you know, whatever it might be. So it is. It's not usually scheduled. Sometimes we do like events, like we've done really? different competitions with the Nerf guns. We've had like a sniper competition with the really big long ah, Nerf guns. Yes. And so we'll keep a tally and we'll form into teams, mm -hmm. and we'll do that for an hour or two at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, we've done a few things like that, like punt, punt pass and kick competitions with like the the squishy footballs that we have, and just a little different fun stuff. Well, you were saying that this isn't just a workspace, obviously, it's more than that, and it was always intended to be a mm -hmm. place like home, away from yeah. home, if you will, and some people work late hours, other people work, it's, it's very open in that regard as well. Um, how is it that, do, do people really get comfortable with that early on, or do you find them take some time to, like, I can take this, how, you know, yeah, the I, schedule or whatever? People get comfortable with it very quickly, because it's so open, and so it's, it's very kind of, whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, so people, you know, we, that's an important part of the interview process is getting them comfortable with us as much as we want to get comfortable with them because they, you know, they are joining a family in a lot of ways. So they have to make sure that they feel that they're going to fit and be able to contribute and be able to, um, you know, be a functional part of what we're doing. But also be comfortable and be at home. So yeah. you've got a TV room, a game room, yep. a, we have a uh, nap huge. room. Yeah, a nap room. So it's blacked out the the the, the mm -hmm. windows, and you can get some sleep in there. Do people really sleep in there? Yeah, I've done that time too. Okay. It's pretty nice. Okay. Um, How do they know when? But what about deadlines? What about oh, you know, we're launching this, or, or you know, we need to have mm -hmm. this statistical data by then. So this is all predicated on getting your stuff done. <laughs> so I mean, that's just that's we have very few rules here, uh -huh. and one of the very few rules we have is just get your stuff done, and then mm -hmm. we won't worry about the rest. We uh -huh. don't punch clocks. We don't manage lunch times. You just kind of you take what you need. That includes days off. We have people that take just days off when they need them. Mm -hmm. They have to obviously let us know so we don't just think they're missing. Mm -hmm. But as long as their stuff is done, that's, a, that's the one question we always ask when you want to take time off. Is that a technical term? Get your stuff done. It's it's usually stuff yeah. done. SD. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's usually not stuff. It's another word that I won't repeat on camera. Oh, got it. <laughs> but yes, very um, good. As long as they're handling it, then then that stuff all kinds of falls into place. And, and it's good. it's it's nice to see. That's part of the empowerment with people is that once we give them that ability to set their own time, set their own schedule, work how they want, when they want, they get their stuff done in a very efficient way, and then they're they're able to enjoy the rest of the time. It really takes a lot of the pressure off mm -hmm. that they put on themselves, mm -hmm. or that you know, in a different work environment, we would be putting on them. Got it. And it, it usually produces you know better work, less errors, faster, which is extremely important in software development. So, just getting back to culture for one more time, I'm sure. curious if you were to put a name on it or describe it specifically, like I, I said, nugget market reward yeah. the doer. What would you call your culture? Um, Collaborative is the best word that I can use to kind of all-encompassing because it goes beyond just you know the the work process that we have. It's you know we do a lot of team building exercises and um, they're not even really exercises. It's like we rent out a theater and we'll take our you know all of our employees and their families to the movie mm -hmm. and we will go race go karts. We'll go do paintball, but it's all kind of team oriented working together. And so we apply that to and it sounds like. Fun is an element, like a condition. Extremely. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, it's, it's very, very important to us because we want to enjoy the time that we have here. I mean, we mm -hmm. have to work. We might as well make it fun. Mm -hmm. And we feel that, again, that, that improves just the quality and quantity of the work that we can get done. So okay. um, that, that family atmosphere, that collaborative environment is extremely important and critical to, to who we are. So the dragon. Yeah. I'm curious. Does the dragon just symbol, is there a symbol beyond, I mean, the dragon's awesome, right? Yeah. Especially this one. Is, I love it. I've never seen anything like it in the lobby. Uh, does it mean anything more? Do you ever think of it in terms of the, uh, like the double entendre of a dragon, the, 
the human struggle, or does it, or is it strictly this is fun? These are dragons; they're killing each other, so or we're killing them. Just for I mean, for me personally, and kind of for the company, it does have you know more significance because this was the first dragon in our first game, mm -hmm. and this, this particular yeah. one. And so this was at the end of the original content that was in our first game. And if you got there, it was like this this big build up, and it was this just epic moment. And so. Mm. We, when we actually commissioned this, we didn't tell our employees. Uh, so it wasn't until their first day of work that they walked in and they saw this dragon there. And it had that meaning of like, this is our, you know, there's been this build up to this moment, to this, you know, to this event of us getting the office that we want and the environment mm -hmm. we want and mm -hmm. just taking our company to the next phase. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, every time I see it, it reminds me of, you know, the, the, the struggle and the progression and the hard work that we've put in to get to this really special place and moment in time mm -hmm. that we have right now. It's great. Yeah. So uh, just wrapping up, what would you say attracts people to Fifth Planet and the games that you create and in this working environment that you've created? Um, I think w we look for, and people look for the same thing in us, that a, a passion and a drive for what we do. Um, I think that the people that we're looking for are, are looking for that in us. So they want to make sure that we're not making games just to try to make a profit or to try to you know, focus on the analytics and squeeze every dollar out of a player that we possibly could. Mm -hmm. they, the people that we want are attracted to us because we care about our players, we care about our employees. We are so appreciative of what we get to do every day mm -hmm. that it just makes it special and enjoyable and, and just a, a great experience for everyone. So I think that stands out in our interview process um, and the people want to come to work here because they just want to be part of the kind of what we've built. And do you get that feedback from your customers, from your game, your players? Do they, yeah. Do they, do they differentiate you from other game companies or the games that they play with you because of Yeah, that? because of the way we treat, uh, I mean, they don't see too much of the way we treat our employees. They, they know our employees are very happy, mm -hmm. but the way we treat our, our players is very different. Mm -hmm. It is very, um, you know, we are very open with them. We are very transparent. We're all very, very accessible too. I mean, there's a vast majority of our players that have my email or have my mm -hmm. Skype ID. There's actually a good chunk of players that have my cell phone number, which luckily they don't use. <laughs> That's but you know, we are accessible and available and they really appreciate that that goes a long way with our, with our community. Well, again, I think the openness and, and the fun shows in this interview and I really appreciate you taking the time. No problem, I enjoy it. it. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Yep.